Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session, Post Row, Today's Abortion Landscape. I'm Ziva Brandstetter. I'm a senior editor at ProPublica. Thank you so much for joining us. We are gonna have a great panel today. We're gonna to wait for a few more people to join us before we get started. So just hang tight. I wanted to remind you all that closed captioning uh, of the program is available today and can be enabled by clicking on the closed caption option on the bar the bottom, towards the bottom of your screen. And today we're gonna to be having a wide ranging uh, discussion about some of the reporting we've done here at ProPublica. We're going to have two experts who are going to be joining us um, about this really important coverage that you know, we all care about no matter what side of the political spectrum we're on. Um, you know, this is the third event in our three-part virtual discussion series to bring this event uh, to sort of our readers and our viewers and people who care about this issue and really bring clarity to the state of reproductive rights. So thank you so much for joining us. We have uh, quite a number of people signed up for this. So I'm glad to see the numbers climbing here of people who are watching. And uh, it looks like we have enough folks to uh, on now, so let's get started. Um, if you're just joining us, my name is Ziva Brandstetter, and I'm a senior editor at ProPublica, and I'll be your host today. I manage a team of reporters that uh, cover this issue at ProPublica, uh, but there are many uh, people at Pro, other people at ProPublica covering this issue as well. And uh, welcome to today's uh, session, post row today's abortion landscape. Again, as I said, closed captioning of the program is available and can be enabled by clicking on the closed caption option at the bottom of your screen. And as an additional note, today's session is being recorded and a link to the video will be emailed to everyone who is registered. Um, you know, for those of you who are new to us, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom. We're dedicated to investigative journalism. You can find a link to our reproductive health care coverage in the chat. Um, and we have a whole landing page where all of this coverage has been gathered. We've done quite a few stories since the uh, big, discuss big decision from the Supreme Court overturning uh, Roe v. Wade, that is the Dobbs decision. And uh, today we had planned to talk to a few of our, our reporters um, who've been writing this coverage <clears throat> to review uh, their, their coverage and to review our coverage of maternal health and access to abortion. Unfortunately, three of those reporters could not make it. They uh, had you know, emergencies come up, which happens in life. So we are here at any rate, and we have another reporter with us who has written a really fascinating story about privacy. And then we have our two experts who will be joining us later in the program. So I'm going to talk about the reporting that uh, that reporters have done that I have edited and has raised some really important issues. Um, and, uh, you know, we may be wrapping up a little bit earlier today than planned, but we're going to stay here as long as we can to answer the questions that you all have. Uh, to begin our presentation today, I'd like to invite Jennifer Gollin to join us on screen. And uh, while she's joining us, I am, hi Jennifer, I'm going to introduce, tell you a little bit about her and her story, and then she and I are going to talk about it. Um, she's an investigative reporter with the San Francisco Chronicle, and Jennifer has reported on topics ranging from oil companies that dodge accountability for workers' deaths to uh, offenders who kill their intimate partners with guns that they possess illegally. And she recently published an investigation with ProPublica as a freelancer. So Jennifer, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. Um, so I, I wanted to talk to you about, uh, could you just sort of sum up uh, for, for our viewers what you found when you were looking at the issue of uh, people who are looking online for abortion medication, as you know, more than half of the, of the people in America who do obtain abortions do so with medication versus surgical procedure. So could you sum up what the reporting found um, that you did? Sure, uh, thank you. So we used a tool from the markup, a technology journalism website, um, which shows you which web trackers websites are using. And we took an in-depth look at the online pharmacies that sell abortion pills to find out what kind of web trackers they're using and what kind of data is being shared with third parties, including Google and other tech companies. What, what, what are the consequences of this type of data? I mean, I was, we, we found that it was being shared and that most of the people who were visiting these, these websites, these pharmacy websites, were not aware of that because of these trackers. Um, what are the consequences of this type of data being shared with third parties? Well, that's exactly right. So the, 
kind of details that um, are being shared with these other third parties include things that people click on, the search terms they're using uh, to find a website, um, the previous site that they had visited, their mm -hmm. general location, um, information about the devices they're using, a laptop or a mobile device, a phone. And this information, while it helps these websites function, it also can potentially identify users. And the key here is that we found that with Google in particular, these websites were sharing a random number that was unique to users' browsers. Mm. And why does it matter? Well, it can be then triangulated with other data that those tech companies are collecting to potentially identify users. So um, why might this be a problem? Well, prosecutors can then go get that data. Um, you know, we found um, that law enforcement can use people's behaviors when visiting these websites that sell abortion pills to build cases against them um, to prosecute abortions. Um, and there have been cases like this um, in places like Georgia, Idaho, and Indiana. Yeah, and, and obviously this issue is very important in the news. Wyoming became the latest state to uh, pass legislation regarding abortion medication uh, last week, uh, specifically outlawing it. There's a big question as to whether states can even do this and what the rights are. Uh, there was a big sort of reaction to your story. And I know that uh, it had some impact. It, it got picked up in a number of places. That's right. Um, Popular Science, Ms. Magazine, um, Washington Post, and some other outlets picked up the um, piece and it was shared and viewed more than 25,000 times on mm -hmm. social media. I think this has relevancy for people because of the important role that abortion pills play yeah. Um, in our, you know, our current debate. And as we've seen, you know, it's um, now the really the fulcrum of these uh, political cross currents um, with the case in Texas um, that's pending and things like that. So, and it's such an important um, source of um, abortions for um, people, particularly in restrictive states. Right, right. I think this is going to be uh, with the lawsuit, uh, the case in Texas, of course, I'm sure that most of our viewers are aware that a, a federal judge in Texas now is, is getting ready to decide whether the FDA had authority to give approval to one of those abortion drugs that is part of the two drug combination. And that could have a sweeping national effect. So um, I, I guess the, the sort of takeaway from your story is that people need to be aware of the tracking technology that um, a, a website could have on it and um, try to do the best that they can to make sure um, what information their computer is sharing with other websites that they visit. It's true. I think that was sort of one of the points that I learned um, in reporting this story. I assume that HIPAA might protect your information because it's medical. Um, that's what I assumed. But um, what I came to learn through the reporting is that this privacy law does little to constrain the amount and type of data that tech companies can collect from uh, consumers. So Google and Facebook are generally not bound by HIPAA, which, as you know, limits the you know sort of certain healthcare. Um, providers and health plans from sharing patients' data. So law enforcement can go and obtain this information from these tech companies. And that's why this matters. Um, you know, Google, um, from their latest numbers, while they require a court order or a search warrant um, for law enforcement to obtain personal information like this, um, they received more than 87,000 requests, um, subpoenas and search warrants in the U.S. in the most recent year available in 2021. Mm -hmm. Right. And I should say that um, Google uh, said that they com the company complies with all laws and requirements, and um, but they did decline our request to give us specific information about whether any of those subpoenas um, had to do with uh, these pharmacies and people ordering medication, you know, we weren't able to get specific information about whether uh, this information is sort of being gathered by subpoena. Um, but they did, uh, Google did say it's complying with all, all laws. So anything that That's I've missed right. there, Jennifer, or anything that you want to add, I guess, in summary? 
Well, I think for those who are looking to protect themselves um, and are concerned about their privacy, they can install um, a web browser such as Brave or Firefox um, that offers some sort of privacy protections. And um, you know, these browser extensions are also available to block third-party trackers. Um, they can adjust the privacy settings on their br uh, browsers. Um, so all of that, I feel like, is uh, worthwhile advice. Um, and uh, using Tor is another good option on top of that um, to anonymize IP addresses. Right. We um, did have a, 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 yeah, someone in the chat, Hope, was asking about how to protect um, herself or people, how can people protect themselves online? And so there are browsers that allow you to um, browse with and, uh, you know, access information without being tracked. So anti-tracking technology and browsers, you know, we're not uh, IT specialists, so we're not here to give you advice on which ones you should choose, but Tor is an option and there, and there are definitely options where you can um, sort of have more privacy in your browsing habits. So consult, consult your local IT specialist. In my case, that would be my husband. So <laughs> that's right. That's right. Anyone who know your kid, whoever knows. Um, that's right. Thank you. Um, thank yeah, you. I, yeah, I really appreciate the the story, and um, would love to see you follow that up. And any any um, input that you have, you know, throughout the program, feel free to jump on and you know, sort of answer questions that our audience has. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time, Jennifer. Uh, so I did also want to talk about some of the reporting that we have done at ProPublica that uh, the reporters who couldn't be here today have done. Kavitha Serana, who was on my team, has spent many months in Tennessee, and that has this, the nation's most restrictive law. Um, basically, Tennessee's law, as some of you may know, makes it a felony for a doctor to perform an abortion um, with a punishment up to 15 years in prison. There are no explicit exceptions in Tennessee's law. So uh, essentially, the doctor, if a, if, if a doctor performs performs an abortion to save a mother's life, let's say, he or she could be charged and, and then would have to go into court. It's called an affirmative defense and would have to essentially prove that that abortion was necessary. And again, risk prosecution. So the, the law is the strictest law in the nation. And in October, Kavitha obtained a recording of sort of a strategy, strategy session between anti-abortion activists, both national and state-based in Tennessee and lawmakers that were preparing for the upcoming session. And so she was able to really show a very behind the scenes look at um, the advice that uh, anti-abortion activists were giving lawmakers there in that state, which mind you already had the toughest law in the nation. And essentially the, um, the folks who uh, were advising the lawmakers there and had helped them write the law in the first place were telling them not to create exceptions, but to double down on the law and to sort of keep it in place. And there were some statements made during this, um, during this strategy session, reminding uh, lawmakers that doctors could only perform an abortion in cases in which, for example, to prevent an organ system from failing. That was one of the actual quotes that was used during this strategy session. Um, you know, the, the anti-abortion activists also coached lawmakers on messages aimed at swaying the larger public to be more accepting of these, uh, these this very strict law. Um, opinion polls show that roughly six in 10 Americans support, generally supports the right to abortion with some limitations. Um, so it is uh, sort of the law in Tennessee does tend to go against the general uh, public opinion. Uh, so they talked a little bit about that in the strategy session and, and Kavitha's story reported that the anti-abortion activists were advising lawmakers that to do things like hide behind the skirts of women who had maybe uh, suffered a sexual assault, had a baby, and thought that the exception was not needed in the law because their situation uh, turned out okay. So it was a very interesting look um, into that specific group of folks who were fighting for not um, exceptions, but for an even tougher law, um, what was already the toughest law in, in the nation. And then Kavitha wrote a second story that um, followed uh, the uh, months long uh, sort of experience of a woman named Mayron Michelle Hollis. And Mayron Michelle Hollis had a uh, her embryo had implanted in her cesarean scar tissue. So she had essentially what's like an ectopic pregnancy, but it was a cesarean scar pregnancy. And because she had had a prior uh, birth with a cesarean scar. And uh, her doctors told her that her pregnancy could uh, take her life. And she had other children. This is a woman who worked uh, installing insulation, uh, working uh, very hard and to feed her family. And so she could not travel to obtain an abortion. And by the time she made her decision, 
um, the law had already gone into effect in Tennessee, essentially banning abortion, making abortion illegal. So Kavitha's story very sensitively from all sides of this issue, talked to the doctors who had to make this decision uh, not to perform an abortion, uh, to talk to the woman herself uh, who had to confront losing her fertility if she wanted any hope of you know, an abortion, but that was not even an option open to her by the time this uh, law passed and her decision was made. Um, and it's a very complicated case. So we were proud that we could bring that story to our readers um, because uh, it, it really, people were shared with us that it, it, it was um, something that people on both sides of the political spectrum could read and had an opinion about. Uh, so I would encourage you all to read it and think about your thoughts and, and where the story left you. Um, it, was, it, it sort of captured the nuances to this story, which is not a black and white story because these are real people's lives that are affected. Um, Lizzie Presser's uh, story uh, looked at, uh, I believe it was in August, looked at parental involvement laws, which have been on the books for a long time in America, and they require minors to either notify or get consent from their parents for an abortion. And uh, these are very popular uh, in many states across the country. But if young people can't turn to their parents because maybe there's a situation with parental abuse, maybe the parents are vehemently anti-abortion, maybe they're gone, or maybe their situation is otherwise unsafe. Uh, these young people have to go to a judge and prove that they're mature enough to end their pregnancies. And so Lizzie's story really uh, dove into the experience of one young woman and, and looked at uh, this procedure known as judicial bypass and, noticed, and, and noted that these procedures are rife with bias and that judges delay or deny care in some cases to minors for subjective reasons. So we invite you to read the story of that young woman that Lizzie Presser told. She was forced to carry her pregnancy to term and, and how a judge's ruling forever changed her life and some of the children that are being brought into the world because of these decisions. Um, again, complicated stories, right? Uh, with no easy out, uh, answers, um, but we uh, appreciate your thoughts on, on, on these issues. And then the last story I was gonna summarize just very briefly is we had a story by Megan Rose who looked at um, some of the laws that are being considered now for this next round of legislatures that are meeting, the laws banning, um, banning medication, laws affirming the right for doctors to, in states that, are, uh, that allow abortions, affirm, uh, protecting doctors from laws that might punish them from other states. Um, there's a lot of complicated interstate uh, activity going on and sort of looking at the new legal landscape in both blue states and, and red states um, because this issue has been thrown to the states. So that's just a very brief overview of some of the um, some of the reporting we've done, it's all on that landing page there, which I think the link has been put into our chat. I encourage you to read, read it and we have a call out there as well. Um, so the call out is for people to fill out and tell us their experiences. Um, if some of you have had experiences that uh, either yourself or people that you know that you think our reporters should be looking into um, regarding the impact of, the, of these abortion restrictions, we would very much like to hear that. We would like to know um, how to get in touch with uh, the people that you think we should talk to. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our special guest panelists and invite them to join us on screen. Now that you've heard about some of our reporting and um, you've heard about Jennifer's reporting. Um, and while they're joining us, I'll just go ahead and give their, um, their, their impressive resumes to you. Um, Mary Ziegler is the Martin Luther King Professor of Law at University of California of Davis. She is one of the leading historians of the US abortion debate and is the author of six books on the law, history and politics of reproduction in the United States. Dr. Dr. Nikki Zeit, did I say that right? Zeit. Sorry, Zeit. As a Ziva, I should have checked that with you beforehand. Dr. Nikki Zeit graduated from Northwestern University Medical School, and she did her residency in OBGYN in Memphis, Tennessee, at the University of Tennessee. She completed her complex family planning fellowship in MPH in Chicago, and Nikki currently resides in Tennessee, where she is the professor and vice chair of education and advocacy in the, uh, in the Department of OBGYN at the University of Tennessee Graduate School of Medicine. Um, so before jumping into today's conversation, I'd like to note that our guest speakers here are here today to represent their own personal perspectives and their thoughts are, are not a reflection of their institutions. So they're here to represent um, 
their experiences and their thoughts, and that those are their own perspectives, not of their institutions. Um, similarly, at ProPublica, you know, we report on how issues like abortion impact uh, and even harm the public in some cases. We don't take policy stance on these issues themselves. We don't write editorials. We don't opine. We don't contribute to organizations on either side. We, we try to bring you the truth. Um, so that's sort of just wanted to set the table for our discussion. Um, Mary, so welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Mary, on Friday, Wyoming became the latest state to outlaw the use of abortion medication. How do you see the criminal legal landscape playing out? Like, will women eventually be targeted for seeking an abortion? That So far, that's something that lawmakers have tried to narrowly avoid. Um, so will women be targeted? And, and if so, what will that look like? I think it's unpredictable. We've seen a rising trend um, within the anti-abortion movement of people who identify themselves as abolitionists. And they essentially argue that if the movement is serious, that a fetus or unborn child is a rights holding person, that it would be logical to punish women too, right? Because if you a, a woman murdered a 10 year old or a 20 year old right. or whatever, we would prosecute them for murder. And that, that movement has gained a foothold in, in a lot of states. The most recent manifestation um, that people may have heard was uh, South Carolina. There were over 20 lawmakers sponsoring a bill that would treat abortion as murder and potentially subject um, women to the death penalty for having abortions. Um, getting The fact that that bill got 20 people sponsoring it was really striking to me. And we've seen um, mm -hmm. other kind of abolitionist bills emerging through committee in Louisiana. So on the one hand, I think that's a trend we can't dismiss, partially because I think it, it's very difficult. Um, it may be very difficult unless the anti-abortion movement is successful with some of its strategies to achieve a kind of backdoor national ban, like the one you mentioned that's happening um, in the federal court in Amarillo um, right now, or efforts to look to the, the Federal Comstock Act, which is an anti-vice law that was passed in the 19th century to essentially get a de facto national ban. If that doesn't work, then what's going to happen is that conservative states are going to have to try to find strategies that will allow them to prosecute doctors or other people who are helping people get abortions in blue states or purple states, and that's mm -hmm. kind of constitutionally and legally uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. There's going to come a time, I think, where the abolitionists are going to be able to say, look, it's much, much easier for us to prosecute women who are in our states, right? There's no question we have the ability to prosecute them. Um, so I think that we, we've sort of seen set up a real conflict within the anti-abortion movement, and I think to some extent within the GOP too, so far the kind of mainstream consensus within the movement that punishing women is a bad idea politically, it's a bad idea morally, um, is holding up. But I think it's it's fragile. Um, and you see, I think, even, um, even in the mainstream movement, some sense that the reason it's not okay to punish women, right? It, the, the argument often that's offered is that women don't know what they're choosing, right? They're being manipulated by abortion doctors, by the abortion industry, as the movement would put it. Um, but I mean, that leaves open the possibility that that what what if women know, right? What if women get it? What if women know what they're choosing? Like then is mm -hmm. then does punishment follow? So I think we're in a moment of tremendous uncertainty when it comes to that. Um, and I think it how much of a push we see to punish women will depend on whether other strategies that the movement's pursuing right now succeed or not. Right. And of course, we have the case in Texas, which is sort of walking up to that line in which, um, you know, people are allowed to sue other parties for yep. help, helping obtain an abortion. And, and a man has sued uh, three women who are, uh, I think, friends of his ex-wife. And so there are things like that that are happening that sort of walk up closely to that line. It's very interesting. Um, Nikki, could you tell us about your experience in Tennessee? I talked about our reporting in Tennessee, but I'm interested to know what have doctors in Tennessee be, um, been seeing since the law went into effect there? Well, I think, you know, of course, there was the immediate intended consequence, right? Abortion became illegal. And as you mentioned, the way our law is written, ending any pregnancy is illegal. So immediately our outpatient abortion clinics closed, several of them. And that not only had the effect of making abortion more challenging to um, access for people who needed that care, but it also made it harder for those of us that teach abortion for the next generation of OBGYNs to be able to provide that care, to not have that opportunity to teach in our state. Uh, and then we had all of the unintended consequences the cases like ectopic pregnancy that you mentioned, the yep. uh, cases of inevitable but not complete miscarriage, 
the cases of pre-viable PPROM, the cases of that ambiguous, how close to death does she need to be for it to meet the standards um, of uh, protecting or saving her life. And um, it became this um, you know, complicated legal uh, situation where physicians not only felt like they had to make medical decisions, they then had to run it by hospital legal or you know, a criminal uh, attorney. We are used to dealing with malpractice and having to practice the standard of care. We are not used to being criminalized for practicing care. Um, and all of us carry malpractice insurance, but nobody carries felony insurance. It doesn't exist. Right. Um, so there was a lot of scrambling and fear and you know, frankly, we lost a really great uh, high risk OB doctor from Chattanooga to a um, permissive state. We lost a complex family planning provider from uh, Nashville to a permissive state. And then, of course, all the amazing physicians that were working at our outpatient clinics providing um, abortion and other reproductive health care left the state. So we've lost a lot of uh, physicians and we don't know the impact that it will have on trainees, whether or not medical students will want to train in states where they're going to have restrictions on the type of care that they can learn. And frankly, most medical students are reproductive age, mm -hmm. so they're going to have restrictions on their own care. Oh. And then residents and fellows, I mean, if you want to train in high-risk OB, do you want to train somewhere where you can diagnose a problem, but you can't treat it? Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, I have been reading about this, I guess you'd call it a brain drain of, of experts um, in this field who are leaving states like, uh, you know, Wyoming, like leaving uh, the- I mean, the, there's only a couple of OBGYNs in some of those states. So yeah. if they leave, you really have these OB deserts. Wow. Um, okay, well, I, I think I'd love to circle back to that uh, later in the show, but uh, um, Mary, I wanted to ask you a little bit more. You've mentioned the fetal personhood um, laws. Um, does establishing fetal personhood make a pregnant person who has an abortion like a murderer under the law? And like, you know, the South Carolina uh, legislature that you talked about, they were considered this law. And then I think they all of a sudden realized uh, some, several of them said we didn't read it, <laughs> um, which is a little frightening, but um, I mean, how do you think that's going to play out legally? Yeah, I mean, it, it's really, again, hard to say because I think for a long time, so fetal personhood isn't new, one thing to be clear about, like the anti-abortion movement's embrace of fetal personhood as a kind of constitutional argument started in the 60s. And then after Roe v. Wade, it, it seemed to be off the table for the short term. And instead, what you saw was kind of ongoing talk about it within the movement, within the Republican Party platform, which has endorsed a human life amendment to the Constitution since the 80s, but mm -hmm. not a whole lot of insight into what exactly it meant in concrete terms, beyond the idea that abortion had to be illegal and unconstitutional. And so that means that there are really deep differences of opinion on the right right now about what fetal personhood requires, right? So you'll see um, you know, on the one hand, some people on the right saying, well, if, if, a, if a fetus is a rights holding person or an unborn child is a rights holding person, that means we need to treat um, pregnant women a certain way during pregnancy, right? We need to let them drive in the HOV lane. Some of you have heard of that story um, from Texas. We need to, right. there are proposals emerging on the right. We need to make birth free. You know, we need to, uh, you know, as Georgia has its anti-abortion law requiring certain forms of child support during pregnancy. Um, and then on the other hand, you have people saying, well, if, if equal treatment is really the name of the game, and then that requires murder prosecutions for people who have abortions. And you have people, I think, in, in I would say in the middle in the GOP who, who just don't want to get into what fetal personhood requires at all, right? Who want to simply say fetal right. personhood is our rationale for criminalizing abortion, but we don't need to really get into it beyond that. We don't want to open that Pandora's box. Um, and I think we're going to see that get contested too. Um, but so far, it's mostly been um, emerging in in state legislators up to a point, although we haven't seen that many of them fully signing on to personhood. Um, mm -hmm. We've seen it in the, the wrongful death um, lawsuit you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, one question you might have about that is like, why bother with a wrongful death lawsuit? You have Texas's SB8, you have 
criminal abortion laws, literally multiple criminal abortion laws in Texas to choose from, right. why, why do this? And I think in part, the answer is they wanted to say, you know, as the lawsuit says, that um, if you provide someone else with abortion pills, you're you're a, a murderer, right? You're an accomplice to murder. You yourself are a murderer. And that's a personhood argument. So we're going to see it cropping up more in the courts. And I think eventually the end game being a case brought up to the U.S. Supreme Court, which is not, I don't think, a, going to be a favorable venue right now. No. But we're going to see um, those arguments I think continue to filter up and whether they lead to, you know, again, to prosecutions of women or just to, you know, nationwide abortion bans, I think remains to be seen. Yeah, I, there's some interesting mental gymnastics that folks are having to do to support some of these positions. Um, I've, I've noticed some of the legislation now is arguing that abortion is not medical care, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, that it's because if you say it's medical care, then you have to do you have to treat it like all other medical care. I mean, uh, so I think it's it's interesting to see where the logical conclusion is to these arguments. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's been again, I think, because the the new paradigm on the right is a criminal paradigm, right? And so I think mm -hmm. often what you'll see the argument is that abortion is only only takes place when there's a certain criminal intent in place, right? So right. if you are performing a life saving procedure or you know something that would qualify under a state with exceptions or affirmative defenses you're going to see some people saying in the anti-abortion movement well that's not done with a criminal intent to cause fetal demise so that's not an abortion of right. course you know for years for decades we've been talking about abortion as the medical termination of a pregnancy you'll see people use the term spontaneous abortion for miscarriage hmm. so part of what feels so jarring i think is that you're seeing a kind of you know, it's not just semantic, but kind of beyond a semantic fight about what 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 even de defines abortion, right? Is this really a conversation right. about patients' health and that's what matters, or is this a combination conversation about criminal law? In which case, maybe we don't care about that, and we're focusing on whether you had ill intentions and how much of an ill intention you had. Mm -hmm. Which leads us back to like communications and search warrants and, you know, uh, data privacy. There's a lot of questions that that raises. Um, uh, Nikki, you've been part of working on a bill there in Tennessee, I, I believe, to modify uh, Tennessee's law to create clear exceptions, or certainly you know about it, for maternal health care. Can you tell us about that effort and where it stands now? Not in a good place, unfortunately. Um, so, it started out right after the Dobbs decision that myself and a couple of other physician advocates from Nashville um, wrote an open letter to the Tennessee General Assembly, and we got over a thousand signatures from healthcare providers across the state. And that really got attention of the Tennessee Medical Association, the Tennessee ACOG, and some other organizations that took the tenants in that of saying we need to clarify some things in this law. First of all, we've got to move away from the affirmative defense. No physician wants to practice in a guilty until proven innocent type situation. Um, and that's why the, you know, Amtala um, DOJ case in Idaho, you know, put that case uh, under injunction, but Tennessee is still in that situation. Um, we needed to clarify that ectopic and miscarriage management was not part of the law. We needed to be able to take care of patients that were um, victims of rape or incest. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to be able to take care of patients that were um, carrying non-viable pregnancies. We were sticking with the things that, as you mentioned, um, more of the voting population and more of the people really truly felt were not controversial, were right. things that we could all agree on. Now, you know, most of us obviously feel like there is good medical and um, population health data to suggest that access to all abortion needs to be available in order to prevent healthcare disparities and other issues. Yeah. But we knew in Tennessee, we couldn't get to that. So we were going to where we felt that we could get to and um, help as many people as possible. And so um, Dr. Briggs, who a lot of Kavitha's um, story was about, um, sponsored the bill that really asked for all those things. Rape and incest was not included in that bill, but it asked for all those things. Um, one of our high-risk OB doctors, Dr. Kimberly Fortner, um, testified in front of the Population Health Committee on Valentine's Day. So some people will call this the love law, um, but... Uh, it really asked for those things and had very good support. 
um, from bipartisan uh, support. Mm -hmm. And it was passed eight to two out of the Population Health Committee. Immediately, the right to life went to work. Mm -hmm. And they called all their members and got all their members to call all the legislators and started threatening the legislators with losing their ranking. Hmm. Um, and, and their uh, ranking are, would be their ranking from you know, right what, life, like what yeah. voters, yeah, would look at to decide right. if they should vote for them or not. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they'd already stripped that from Dr. Briggs when he came out and said he was going to sponsor this bill. So unfortunately, we now have a very watered down amendment that they're claiming cleans things up, but it really doesn't. I don't think that physicians are going to feel that it gives them much more leeway to provide life-saving care without being criminalized. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that it clarifies, you know, medical complexities or helps us take care of many more patients. The one thing it does do is say ectopic pregnancy is not part of this. Yeah. That's not enough. As I understand it, that language is pretty restrictive and, and still um, is a very narrow needle of the thread and, and, and that medical experts who looked at it said it's not going to be much help. Correct. I mean, basically they asked us our opinion and then did not take it at all. Interesting. Um, what are the problems uh, with policymakers trying to determine what constitutes a medical emergency? Well, first of all, I think that the idea that it has to be a medical emergency is the first problem. We right. should be yeah, able to, to prevent that. an emergency, not just treat emergency. And that came up in that um, in, in that population health committee meeting where clearly the right to life wants it to be a true emergency, right. which is not a good use of healthcare resources. If I'm already taking care of emergency, putting a patient in the ICU, using blood products, when I could have done the case two days before and it not be that serious, her not have risk of heart failure, kidney failure, those things, hmm. it would have made a lot more sense to take care of her then. Of Especially when the overwhelming evidence from most of these cases, which we have data out of Texas to show, it doesn't improve the outcome for the pregnancy. Staying pregnant if your water broke before 22 weeks does not lead to a better outcome for a baby. It just puts the mom at risk. That's why laws for abortion have been liberalized in places like Poland and South and Central America um, and Ireland. Women died because they were made to stay pregnant until there was no longer a heartbeat and they um, got infected or bled. Mm -hmm. We don't yeah, want to go I mean, back to that in the United States. And legislators don't seem to understand that that's the inevitable outcome of what they're forcing us to do. I do. I have had a question about that as a journalist. I mean, I mean, are, how are we going to know if how many women are um, suffering measurable harm? How are we going to know how how many women might die, or when, or if a woman is going to die? Well, and how long is it going to take us to get that data? I mean, when we look at the state maternal mortality reports, so one, they're not always that accurate. You know, it takes the death reports at the end of the year and then the reviews. Usually we're two or three years behind. Um, well, as a journalist, I can say that uh, I think transparency is important in this area and having, you know, the data available to the public is, is very important. So if anyone out there listening to this is aware of any source of data that the public needs to have access to that might be able to measure the impact of these laws, we're certainly interested in that and knowing more about what, what data we, what reports and records we can gather, what sources of information um, experts like you or journalists like us uh, should be looking at. And in a timely fashion, because these delays are only going to allow it to continue to happen for longer. Yeah, I mean, these things are happening. So I don't, uh, and, you know, uh, policymakers are pretty good at counting things and requiring reports. And, you know, um, so, so is the medical community. So it seems like a reasonable thing for um, data to be available to measure the impact of these, of these laws. Um, and uh, I, I know that you know, having information shouldn't be a shouldn't be a bad thing for the public. Um, and I'm going to ask our experts one or two more questions here, and then we're going to go to your questions. Um, so, Mary, you recently wrote that the court does not get the final word even on the meaning of its own important decisions. Can can you talk about that? It's a very interesting uh, statement. 
Yeah, I mean, I think what we've seen, uh, what we saw with Roe, I mean, if you look uh, at the the way that the papers of the judges who wrote Roe, they pretty clearly thought that they were settling this, right? And that Roe was going to mean that abortion was a thing between a doctor and a woman. The doctor was just as much a stakeholder as the woman. It wasn't a feminist thing. And everybody was just going to agree with that and move on. And of course, they were wrong on both scores. Um, Roe became a symbol of women's rights, right? I mean, so much so that you'll see, you know, the women's march saying we're more than Roe, like as if the women's movement was about Roe in the first place or was synonymous with Roe. Mm -hmm. uh, you also see, of course, um, you know, Roe did not obviously settle the abortion debate um, within the court, outside of the court, and so on. And I think the court in Dobbs is sort of trying to say the same thing, that we should be looking at um, what the Supreme Court defines as history and tradition um, in resolving our constitutional disputes, and that history and tradition in the court's view, probably not in the view of most historians, um, me, would not have recognized right to abortion at, in the 19th century, and that that's kind of the end of it. Um, and we're already seeing, I think, Dobbs emerging as a symbol of things the Supreme Court didn't want it to be, right? I mean, we've seen a lot of poll data documenting um, a really precipitous decline in trust of the Supreme Court, um, and Dobbs being kind of the, the most visible symbol of that decline. Uh, and so I think the court often holds itself out as having the last word on these constitutional struggles um, when it can't. And also, we've often seen Americans who are not lawyers help to define what these decisions stand for in our politics. And we, I think we're seeing that happen with Dobbs, and we definitely saw it happen with Roe. Great. Uh, fantastic. Thank you both so much for that. So uh, I want you to hang on. Uh, we're going to have uh, Q&A from our audience. And um, so leading up to this event, uh, registrants submitted over 100 questions to our panel. And we did our best to select the questions that were asked repeatedly by registrants. So many of you out there will have questions that we're going to we're going to get to, but you can also put questions in the chat. Um, we'll be addressing a few of those as well as questions that are being submitted live during the program. And again, if you'd like to ask a question, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and submit it to us. Um, we have had a question um, regarding journalists, and I'm going to read this and then I'm going to I'm going to answer it. So I have no prep here, but I'm a journalist and have a question about covering abortion. I think we can objectively describe the banning um, the, the, the banning and heavy restriction of abortion as a human rights issue. Uh, what are your thoughts, meaning ProPublica and the journalists here, and if banning abortion is a human rights violation, does it behoove us as journalists to necessarily include the voices of anti-abortion lawmakers and activists to create a balanced story? That That's the sort of um, question that journalists also dealt with in some level on the climate change issue uh, and where early on in reporting about climate change, you would see journalists go to uh, one or two sort of industry experts, to, you know, and get the, on the other hand, um, perspective. And, you know, the, there's a notion of false ba balance in journalism. And I think um, that we should in, try to ensure that our stories, especially the stories about laws that are the most harmful, appeal to people on all sides of this of the political spectrum, because um, it's important to educate people and to stick to the facts. And so in our reporting, we've tried to stick to the facts, but the facts are that this woman that we profiled in, in, in Tennessee um, had to be rushed to the hospital hemorrhaging and nearly died and delivered a baby at 26 weeks, which probably cost the taxpayers of Tennessee millions of dollars, spent three months in the NICU, had a helicopter flight, probably will cost the taxpayers of Tennessee millions more dollars throughout its uh, life, which is, by the way, going to be a very difficult life. So a baby was brought into the world um, that uh, uh, a family wasn't ready for and that um, now has to be cared for. And so that's a fact. And so I just think as journalists, we have to tell the facts. We're very interested in knowing about people on all sides of this issue, but I think we have to see how it's playing out on the ground as well. Um, so I don't think we need to label it. Uh, I think um, readers can draw their own conclusions about, about, about abortion restrictions and, and whether they're a human rights issue or not. Um, I think once you get into criminalizing people for, uh, for, accessing the medical care system. Um, that's a, that's a, that's a, a harm that I think as journalists, we have a responsibility to write about. Um, 
So for our first submitted question to our experts, um, the person asked, what can people in states that still protect the right to abortion do to safeguard maternal health for themselves and for others in states that now ban the right to abortion? So either of you can answer that. I know, um, you know, it might, I don't want to put you in a situation of answering a question you don't uh, know the answer to. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. I think that, uh, oh, sorry, Mary. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I'm feeling pretty discouraged in Tennessee, frankly, um, because we have a super majority of people who are very anti-choice and are not shy about it and don't um, necessarily um, care to really um, try to live in the shoes of the physicians or the people who need this care. Um, and so I honestly think it's gonna take ballot initiatives and we don't have that option in Tennessee. We lost that option in 2014, um, but there are other states that do. And you know, even right now, the Supreme Court case, or sorry, the Supreme Court election in Wisconsin, like I'm following that because yeah. I see that that might have a big factor in the 2024 elections overall. Mm -hmm. And I really need something to happen at a federal level because I don't know that it's going to happen. You know, normally you say state elections are important, right. but when they've been gerrymandered too much or they're too, um, it's going to take too long. Like right. I don't see things getting better in Tennessee for decades. So mm -hmm. I, I think I'm focusing at a federal level. And I think, you know, I walk around with my voter registration card on my ID badge. I walk around with a QR code for voters registration on my coffee mug and everywhere. Um, Tennessee has a really, really poor voter turnout, really low engagement, and we've got to fix that. Yeah. Uh, Mary, any input on that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, obviously there there have been some strategies developed. Well, I, I guess I would say to begin with, I don't I think it's it's <laughs> based on what's going on now in the federal courts. If you're living in a state where abortion is legal, you should not take for granted that that will remain the case. There oh. are I think the leading strategies on the anti-abortion side now that they've they've accomplished a lot of what they want and in places like Tennessee has been to pivot to strategies that would eliminate access to abortion nationwide. Now, that's not going to happen through Congress. Um, we don't Republicans in Congress, even if they control both houses of Congress and the White House, I don't think are going to do that. We've seen no sign of that happening. Um, from the House GOP or otherwise. But there are legal strategies, um, both the, the Mifepristone case we've been talking about in Texas, which could, um, depending on how the FDA responds, make it impossible for people in a state like California to have a medication abortion the way the protocol or kind of standard of care is, is provided for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the Comstock Act strategy, which is in the Texas case and otherwise, which essentially if, if a judge bought it and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court and was successful, might mean that all abortions are criminal nationwide. That's the interpretation of this old anti-vice law that anti-abortion attorneys are advancing. So I think a, a good first step is to realize how much 2024 is going to matter to that. Um, the FDA has enforcement powers, right? And who is in the FDA, which who's the president will define how much the FDA comes after people. If a judge says, hey, Mifepristone, no longer legal, whether the FDA uses a lot of time and energy to enforce that will depend on who is in the White House. Um, similarly, if a federal court comes along and says, oh, by the way, the Comstock Act means you can't have an abortion anymore, who's in the Justice Department is going to have a lot to do with whether that's enforced. So I think to begin with, you, you shouldn't feel a false sense of security if you're living in a state where abortion is legal. Um, I think in terms of, you know, pivot points, we're seeing a lot of energy being directed toward ballot initiatives and also kind of second order things related to ballot initiatives. We've seen some Republican legislators essentially moving to make it harder to get ballot initiatives directly yeah. before voters. So I think that's an area where you can pay attention um, in a lot of, I think, contested states, but also conservative states. Um, I, I, there are some organizations forming in states like Tennessee that don't have ballot initiative options that are looking for kind of what would be arguments that appeal to conservatives um, on abortion. For example, um, in Tennessee and Missouri, we've seen some voices emerging essentially saying, look, you know, we, even if you define yourself as pro-life, 
do you really want to spend a lot of taxpayer money enforcing criminal abortion laws? Because that's going to be really expensive given the amount right. of resources it takes to uncover these things. So we're starting to see some money and effort being directed into new messaging that might appeal to conservatives who have some qualms about how abortion laws are going to be implemented on the ground. Um, state Supreme Courts are another big area um, of, of focus in terms of places you can invest your time and energy. Um, state Supreme Court litigations already paid dividends in South Carolina, which essentially said the state six week ban is unconstitutional um, there and state Supreme Court elections are also a moving target right I mean you state Supreme Court membership turns over a lot more uh, either through retention elections or direct elections so that's something that you can kind of in Wisconsin and elsewhere kind of keep a, a finger uh, on the pulse of that going forward because it's not as if you know, if, if, if things go well or badly, depending on your point of view in a given state Supreme Court election, that's not a forever thing. It's not like when you get, you know, someone like Brett Kavanaugh or Ketanji Brown Jackson confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court, and that's pretty much the end of that for our lifetime. This is a scenario where those same judges will be before voters again. So I think those are all areas that people um, can pay attention to uh, if they're in progressive states. But don't take your for granted that progressive states will remain able to do what they're doing now. Right. Good, very good in, insight. Um, we have this question for Jennifer uh, Gollin. Uh, what outcomes do you see, Jennifer, in, if legislators in states restricting abortion access get a hold of some of this data that, uh, let's say, data of menstrual, menstrual uh, data from tracking apps or the, the, farm, the pill ordering data that you talked about? Sure. Um, based on my understanding, it, it's actually a less of a concern, the um, period tracking apps, and more of a concern um, around the current information that law enforcement is collecting and buying. Um, so there's a great um, organization, um, the Digital Defense Fund, and I'll put that in the chat for everyone, and mm -hmm. they make some recommendations um, in this area. And Consumer Reports has also gone through and looked at these period tracking apps. So I can also put that in the chat. Great, thank you. Um, so let's see, we have a question for either, either one of uh, our experts. What are individuals doing to reestablish the right of access to abortion in their home jurisdiction where that access has been overturned or suspended? I mean, I think we've covered some of that. So you guys have anything else to add? They're trying to do ballot initiatives. They're, you know, I guess this kind of leads to the question of um, exceptions. And I think there's a notion out there that exceptions are good and exceptions allow people to have access to medical care. Um, you know, can, Nikki, can you talk about that a little bit? Is that a false sense of security that, you know, some of these law uh, people are act, sort of saying it, we can add exceptions? Yeah, I think it's complicated. And I think it, um, you know, it's hard to understand because I think that a lot of people think, well, okay, if we add an exception, that's gonna get access for some. But access for some is not actually helping the majority. Um, you know, the type of care that I provide in a hospital setting is less than 1% of abortion care. And mm -hmm. without abortion care, we're going to see maternal mortality go up. We're going to see, um, you know, people stay in abusive relationships and not be able to achieve their goals. All the things that we know from amazing studies like the Turnaway Project mm -hmm. um, and, and other work that, if you don't have access to abortion and it shouldn't be good abortion, bad abortion, it just has to be access to abortion um, because everyone's reason for abortion is a legitimate reason for abortion. Right, it isn't something like what, nine out of 10 abortions or, uh, you know, the vast, vast majority of abortions before, you know, before Dobbs were, you know, abortions in which people decided to have them and, and there wasn't like a medical emergency or there wasn't, you know, a rape. Yeah, and most of them are early if a patient or if a person has the, you know, privilege of being able to get a pregnancy test and know their body, they tend to want to end the pregnancy test, pregnancy if they know they want to end it. Right. Early when it Early, is safe with medication abortion and not have yeah. to have a procedure abortion or a later, more challenging, more complicated, um, more expensive procedure abortion. Mm -hmm. um, but the ones that we see that, you know, tend to seem more acceptable to people are the ones that are medical complications, either something that's gone vastly wrong in a pregnancy, like water breaking at 19 weeks, which a lot of people didn't even realize, you know, there's the um, Chrissy Teigen story. 
Like, mm-hmm. you know, a year and a half after she had her miscarriage, she realized she really had an abortion because, you know, mm-hmm. she was bleeding, but there was still a heartbeat and they had to end the pregnancy to save her life. That's mm-hmm. an abortion. But mm-hmm. that abortion care is a very minor um, number compared mm-hmm. to the abortion access, you know, that we still need to protect people. Okay. Yeah. And I think with exceptions too, we've seen, um, a lot of the history behind exceptions is designed to prevent people from using them as a quote unquote loophole, right? I think there's there's a lot of history um, of exceptions, for example, the Hyde Amendment, which is a ban on Medicaid funding for abortion. The anxiety there was always that if you had a broad health exception, that it would turn into allowing people to get abortions for any reason. And that was more of a harm from the standpoint of a lot of conservative lawmakers than the risk to some patients if you drew exceptions too narrowly. The mm-hmm. other dynamic I think that's influencing how ineffectual exceptions are now is that um penalties are just much higher for violating these laws than they were before Roe, right? So a lot of the times 19th century criminal abortion bans, although there were some variations, you know, the the average number of years people would theoretically spend in prison would be a few years, they'd lose their medical licenses. Now we're talking in states like Texas about people facing up to 99 years in prison, right? So I think you're also putting doctors in, and you're also in some instances having exceptions that are really hard to understand, right? Texas has multiple abortion bans with slightly different exceptions in each one. So you're asking doctors to parse exceptions that are hard to understand and then saying, you know, by the way, if you get it wrong, you're going to prison for a really, really long time. And it's hard to ask people to to gamble that, right? So I I think you also have to understand that the the exceptions uh, kind of in this are in this dynamic with, with penalties and that influences people's access to, I think, inevitably. Right. Uh, fascinating discussion. Um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and have one more question uh, for Nikki, and then I think we're going to wrap it up. This has been such a great discussion today. Um, uh, Dr. Zaid, how are medical schools deciding what procedures regarding ending a pregnancy, so purposely or otherwise, how, how are they deciding what, what is taught and what is their legal standing, especially Tennessee and Texas, one of our person people wants to know? Yeah, well, I mean, currently about half of the OBGYN residency training programs are in ban states. Hmm. Um, and it is a requirement to graduate from a residency and become a board certified OBGYN to be able to perform abortion care. Um, residency programs are required to have what's called opt out training. So if a provider hmm. has a reason they do not want to get training, they can opt out but the training has to be part of residency. So we've been struggling in Tennessee to figure out how we're going to get that training from our, for our residents. We already struggled a little because our hospital had some barriers. So our residents you know, went offsite to a freestanding clinic to get some of their care. Some residents chose to um, go out of state to get more experience even before Dobbs. Um, but now we have no opportunity to get them training. People are looking towards um, more stimulation. There are papaya and other fruit models. There are didactics wow. and other sessions um, that you know they can learn online. And then there are some programs in permissive states that are opening spots and opportunities. But this is something that is going to see how it plays out because there are not enough sites to get everybody trained. Not everyone's going to be able to travel to get trained. Um, and will it actually make it harder to become board certified? So you have a real public health um, risk there that you have people leaving the these states of their own volition. You have training that is very difficult to access and you have uh, people who will be coming to emergency rooms who need abortion care because- So, they so that's the, the situation that I think is very poorly understood. I had a resident when I first got to the University of Tennessee that had opted out of all training um, before I arrived. Um, And even cases where, you know, anencephaly, you know, no brain, no kidneys, she just could not do a case if there was a heartbeat. And that was her belief. And we respect that belief. And she did not get that training. About three months before she finished training, we were called down to the trauma bay and a young woman who was about 16 weeks pregnant had been in a very bad car accident, Mm. open pelvic fractures, and her uterus was just full of blood. Um, And there was still a heartbeat. Sometimes I really do not understand how these uh, pregnancies 
try to continue. Um, mm -hmm. But there was a heartbeat and I um, told the resident, you know, I need to go find the orthopedic surgeon. I need to empty her uterus before he starts pinning her pelvis together because she's going to bleed to death. Um, and the resident said, I'm coming with you. And I said, but there's a heartbeat. And she said, yeah, but there's no way this is ending without her uterus being emptied. And so she came and we did the case together. And afterwards she had this like hmm. crap moment of I'm going to be on my own in three months. What happens if this patient comes in to my ER and I don't know how to do this procedure because I opted out of this training and I am the person who should be able to save her life. Wow. We that need to train profound. people to do these procedures. Yeah. Uh, it's very profound that uh, for everyone who's listening to this today, you know, I think both of our guests and our, and our journalists have really illustrated um, the life and death issues that some people are facing, that this, uh, the privacy issues, um, the personal uh, nature of these issues uh, that are happening to millions and millions of people in our, uh, across the country. So I just really am very grateful for, for your time, um, Mary, Nikki, and Jennifer, um, at talking to the people who joined us today. Um, you know, I think it's really important that we continue these discussions. So I, I really appreciate your time and, and helping us have an intelligent conversation. Um, so that's our time for today. I wanted to say to everyone before you leave, please uh, take our event survey. It only takes a few minutes. It will help us do this better next time. So click on the link in the chat and just fill that out. And we really appreciate it. I want to thank Jennifer Gollin and today's feature panelists for taking the time to bring clarity to today's abortion landscape. And uh, thank you to our audience for joining us and for your thoughtful questions. And again, this event has been recorded. Uh, so if you'll, you'll receive an email with the uh, full video of today's event, and we'll be post posting the recording uh, on ProPublica's YouTube channel. So please stay up to date on all of our programming and uh, upcoming programs by visiting our event page, which is ProPublica.org backslash events, and we'll drop a link in the chat. And then uh, from all of us at ProPublica, thank you so much for your time. Thank you to our guests for joining us. Have a great rest of your evening. See you next time. <laughs>